Hey, thanks for watching Talking 360. I'm Tony Scott, and with me is Sean Stevenson, who is a uh, nutritionist and an author and a podcaster, uh, a husband, a father. I I'm running out of paper to put all the things that he is on here, but he is the author of a best selling book, uh, Sleep Smarter 21 Proven Tips to Sleep Your Way to a Better Body, Better Health, and Bigger Success. Man, what's going on? What's up, man? How you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. You know, I, you know, you and I had talked before, and you always oh, you mentioned how important sleep is. How did you get to the point where you like decided to? I'm going to prove this to everybody how important <laughs> sleep is. Well, man, it was really there was two things. You know, um, the first thing was just in my clinical practice. You know, and seeing people coming in with different health issues and being really successful at that. But then there was this section of people who they seemed to be eating pretty good. And they exercised, but and sometimes they exercise too much. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, what is going on here? Why are they not getting the results that they are really deserving of? You know, and then I looked a little bit deeper and I found that, you know, the health conversation, man, it usually revolves around diet and nutrition right. and, and, uh, and exercise. And that's mm -hmm. it. You know, it kind of stops there. But there's this whole other sphere of things. And this is why the word holistic has become popular today. It means the whole thing. You know, so what about your stress? What about your relationships? What about your sleep? And I drilled down into that and I started to do a little bit of research and, and come to find out some really interesting things like some of my patients who would be uh, type 2 diabetic. And I've got about an 80 to 85 percent reversal rate in my clinic with people with type 2 diabetes completely being free of it. And some people just wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. And I found out that just one night of poor sleep quality can make you as insulin res resistant as a type 2 diabetic even if you don't have diabetes, right? you know? So I was like, hmm, that's interesting. What's going on there? And just start to look at how sleep affects your hormones, affects your brain function and all these wonderful things. And that's part one, just seeing my clinical experience. Part two was, you know, my show has been featured as a number one show on, um, on iTunes, you know, in health, which is just mind blowing in and of itself, the model <laughs> health show. And so since we've been doing the model health show, we've accumulated all these archives and we've done shows talking about reversing cancer, diabetes, body image stuff, fat loss. But I did a show on sleep, and that was one of the top five most downloaded shows. You know, So I was like, huh, hmm. that's interesting. People really want to know about this. So yeah. I took all that together. Instead of creating a product that nobody asked for, I was creating something that people really were interested in. And whenever anybody sees the book cover, you know, they see Sleep Smarter, and then they're like, I need that, bro. You know? <laughs> So there you have it, man. That's how it all got birthed. Yeah. yeah, you've always said that sleep sleep was important, but what defines a bad night of sleep? Is there certain yeah. criteria? Uh, what, what is typically uh, a bad night of sleep? Okay, that's a great question, man. Um, well, first of all, it's, it's and I like to make stuff super simple mm -hmm. because it really is at the heart of it. We all have these sleep cycles, and we go through certain stages of sleep. There's stage one, two, three, and four, basically. And these are basically, the first two stages are known as the REM sleep. And this is where kind of dreaming occurs. The, the brain wave activity starts to go down a little bit. So we're moving out of like the beta, just kind of awake. And like we're all in beta right now into more of the like alpha state. And then we get to theta. And then, but anyway, so, and then we get into stages three and four, which are the deep sleep stages. And this is where all of the metabolic magic happens. This is where your body's secreting the majority of your like human growth hormone that keeps you young and feeling good, uh, reparative hormones, your brain actually, um, the short term memory, you know, the stuff we even as people are listening right now and learning, this sounds all good and fine and dandy, but you won't remember any of it if you don't get high quality sleep because something called memory processing happens and it gets converted from long term to short term. But if you're not getting that deep rejuvenative stage three and four sleep, then there's going to be some problems. And that's really what poor quality sleep is, is not getting those full cycles, mm -hmm. uh, which they tend to last about 90 minutes for each cycle of sleep. And humans tend to require about four to six of those cycles. So we're talking about between six and nine hours of sleep. And, you know, no, not one time in my book, and this kind of just irritates me a little bit, not one time in my book do I say, you need to get blank hours of sleep. Because so what does that, what does that, that why does that irritate you? Because, man, that's the cookie cutter answer. You know, you need to get your eight hours of sleep. But you like, didn't say that, so that's a good thing, right? No. no well, no, it's I'm sorry. It's it's irritating to me that people usually say that. Oh, okay. Uh, I got you. Okay. What right. I 
Yeah. Yeah. My book is not irritating at all. It's very relaxing, <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah, I just made sure to avoid that kind of right. thing where we put people in this dogma, like I'm bad, I'm wrong. I'm not getting my eight hours of sleep. Mm-hmm. Instead, we focus on how do you optimize your sleep? How do you get that high quality, deep rejuvenative sleep as efficiently and as gracefully and get as much as possible? You know, no matter what time of day you're, you're getting to bed. But of course, we do talk about that and get more in depth and like, because there are some money times. There's like specific time that's proven for you to get the most bang for your buck that you actually go to sleep at this time, which we could talk about. But outside of that, man, it's really just about getting the best sleep possible. Okay. So I've heard people say, and, and to me, it's always, a, it's, it's a stupid statement, but people say it all the time. I'll sleep when I'm dead. Yeah. <laughs> I actually put that quote. That's in the first <laughs> chapter of the book. You know, I don't even know what that means because those are two different things, man. You know what? The thing is, like sleep is so weird, Tony. If you really start to think about it, just sleeping of itself is kind of like practicing to be dead. Right. It's kind of mm-hmm. like we lay down and we go completely into this unconscious place where we're 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 potentially, you know, um, we don't have anybody on guard for us. You know, it's like we're very, very vulnerable. And it's a really interesting thing that humans are required to do. But the key word that I just said is that we're required to do this. Mm -hmm. And now in our world today, everything is moving so fast and people are trying to get rich or die trying kind of thing. On the grind. They're on the grind. Right. And it's just all these monikers that are out there that are promoting self-destruction, really. Mm -hmm. You know, like somebody comes to mind, like Lil Wayne, for example. He's like, I don't sleep, Miss Katie. You know, when he Mm -hmm. does is doing his interview or whatever. I don't sleep. Come on, man. And now he's having seizures. You know what I'm yeah, saying? It's like right. it's promoting this idea and putting it into our children that sleep is pointless. You know, I'm mm-hmm. just going to keep working and that's how you make it. It's totally ridiculous. And as a matter of fact, the research shows that it's the exact opposite. The research shows, which I put into the book was, for example, they had individuals complete a task and then they had them complete task being in a sleep deprived state. And what they discovered was that Number one, they made 20% more mistakes. Whoa. All right. Number right. two, it took them four times longer to complete the same task. So not only were they just up, you know, because here's the thing. It's like we can sacrifice our sleep to do more work, but there's a difference between doing work and getting things done. Right. Right. So you're losing your efficiency mm-hmm. because your brain isn't operating at its high, highest capacity. And I get into, you know, like the lack of glucose, literally like your brain starts to starve when you're not sleeping. And this is also why, and this is about 14% from our prefrontal cortex, like our more human evolved part of our brain. And that part of the brain is like for decision making, for distinguishing between right and wrong, that part of the brain starts to starve. And if we've had any experience with like eating gummy bears or or goldfish crackers or some, you know, Doritos, whatever, our brains and our bodies remember, like there's simple sugar in that. Mm -hmm. So let me go eat that food to get some glucose to my brain really quickly. This is why we tend to make poor decisions with what we're eating when we're sleep deprived as well, Tony. So it's like, how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go with this thing? You well, know? Right. So how, how, Sean, how long can or should a person go without sleep before they, you know, start doing damage to themselves? Wow. That's a great question. And, and I, I keep it, you know, again, it's really simple in the book, just citing the thing I told you earlier that just one night of sleep deprivation, 24 hours, can make you as insulin resistant as a type 2 diabetic. Mm-hmm. Just one 24-hour cycle. And um, on top of that, this, the study that I just mentioned with the, um, the uh, poor performance, for, and these were like working class individuals, you know, executives, mm-hmm. and this was just one night of sleep deprivation. They were making, basically you're drunk, you know? Mm-hmm. But we don't have tests for that. And there are right. like people out there driving on the roads and, you know, it's crazy, man. It's really yeah. crazy. And the more I, I really felt this was like my duty to write about this and to get this out there and make it in a way that's engaging and fun and we can get a conversation going instead of making it all weird and, and you know, and everybody's wrong. Like, let's just get a conversation going and let's talk about, as a matter of fact, how can I impl- apply this stuff, you know? Right. Each single, every single chapter, I give power tips. Like, okay, you just learned this stuff. Here's how to try it out. Like, try mm-hmm. this thing to help improve your sleep and to help improve your body, you know, which we could definitely talk about that too. Well, I, I mean, I've always heard that you shouldn't uh, go to sleep on a full stomach. Mm. I've heard, you know, you shouldn't eat right before bedtime. 
because it could affect your sleep. It's not good for your health. Is that true? And does eating heavy before bedtime, does it affect your dreams? Some people say, I had dreams of something, and then this it was because right. you ate late last night, didn't you? Would you? You had some wings right before you went to bed, didn't right. you? You know, and it's like, I mean, is, that, is all that stuff true or not true? Right, right. They had their wings, and they started dreaming about Bobby Brown and, you know, <laughs> did the Don't Be Cruel video. Oh, man. Look, man, this stuff is so, like, the levels that I went to in the research, because I, I devoted six months of research to this. And you know me, Tony, like, I don't play around. Like, if I mm. want to learn something, yeah, I, I really get into it and find the ins and outs of it. And I did a lot of self-experimentation, too, and some crazy stuff, too, man. But what I found, one of the things that was so interesting, because I looked at that, like, what is this whole don't eat late thing? Because I eat late all the time, you know? Mm. And if people, you know, if they go to my website, they could see, like, I'm, I'm pretty good shape, you know? Yeah. And it's not about that. What I found was that whenever we eat, if somebody's at a, at a healthy weight, right, they're, because right now, three-fourths of the American population are either clinically diagnosed as being overweight or obese, which is mm -hmm. just mind-blowing in of itself. But for individuals who are at a normal body weight, you know, um, body fat index, and I don't like BMI too much. That's a whole other thing. But who are, who are, you know, they're relatively healthy. What was found is that after you eat a meal, you're going to get a 5% increase in your cortisol level. And cortisol is this big catch word now. It's a stress hormone. It's not that it's bad. It's just bad when it gets like to be too much. Okay. So 5% increase in your cortisol level, that's normal. What was discovered was that individuals who are overweight, who eat a meal, they get a 51% increase in their cortisol levels. Okay. Five versus 51%. And this is like extremely powerful information to know this. And what's happening is cortisol is the antithesis. It's the complete opposite of the sleep hormone melatonin. If you're producing cortisol, melatonin is down and your cortisol is up and vice versa. At night, your melatonin is supposed to be going up, cortisol is going down. But some people are having these spikes in their cortisol because of eating and because of all kinds of other different things, which we can, of course, get into. But one of those things is eating too late. So they're getting this big secretion of cortisol. So what I encourage people to do in the book, if you are overweight, it's not about don't eat late, just get the weight off. Mm -hmm. And I have devoted a chapter to that. But if you are working on getting the weight off, then we want to have a little bit of a curfew because I don't want to be neurotic about this. I just want to give you this from the perspective of somebody who's actually telling you like you're screwing your hormones up, right? Mm -hmm. And you're not going to get the rejuvenative sleep that you really want. You can fall asleep. You can pass out because you're tired but you're not gonna get that deep rejuvenated sleep and feel good in the morning and be able to like, yeah, I'm gonna go get my workout in, I'm gonna eat great. Instead, you're gonna be walking around like a zombie trying to eat people's brains, trying to eat all these goldfish crackers and Doritos. You know, so really we wanna reel it back in and just, if you're overweight, have a two hour curfew before the time you go to bed. Finish your meals, just say to go, you wanna go to bed at 10 o'clock. You need to be done with that meal by eight o'clock, okay? At the, at the least. And for some reason, if somebody, and I give this little sleep hack, if you do happen to, you know, you're just like, you know, I got to have something, which shouldn't be like that. But if that's the case, you want to eat a food that's high in fat. Okay. And I'm not talking about like Crisco, like, you know, uh, <laughs> hey, partially go, hydrogenated <laughs> peanut butter oil, right? Yeah. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about natural, healthy fats that are in raw form. So like some almonds, some macadamia nuts, some avocado, some olives, Things like that, okay? Mm -hmm. okay? And why I'm saying this is that when you eat foods that are high in carbohydrate, which we tend to do late at night, you're gonna get a tremendous spike in your insulin levels. And if you're, if you're in a spiked state and then you go to sleep, you're eventually gonna bottom out. You're gonna go hypoglycemic and it can happen while you're asleep. And that's gonna pull you out of those deep stages of sleep, and potentially wake you up and make it so you can't fall back asleep. OK, oh, All right. so you want to eat something high in fat because those high carbohydrates is basically like putting little pieces of paper on your metabolic fire. It's going to spark really high and bright for a few minutes, but it's going to burn out. Eating fat is like putting a log on your metabolic fire. It's not going to spark really high, but it's going to be stable and steady. Right. Much more graceful and smart thing to do before you go to bed. All right. Uh, now, let, let, let's get to the bedroom, because you told me one time that your bedroom was a sanctuary and yeah. you don't have a television in your bedroom. Yeah. And it's a very peaceful, serene kind of environment. Yeah. Now, most of us, in fact, probably all of us, with the exception of you, have TVs in our bedroom. Now, why is that like a bad thing? All right. That's a great question, man. Let me I'm, I'm going to start at the 
I'm going to start at the bottom first, the bottom of the pyramid, right? Okay. Here's the biggest reason. This right here, some pe- somebody's going to push pause and they're going to go get their TV out of their room. <laughs> biggest reason is for people who are couples, you know, if yeah. you're in a relationship, it's been shown, proven that people who have televisions in their bedroom have sex 50% less. All right? 50% less jamming because you've got a television in your room. All right? right? Just put that in your pipe and smoke it. All right, so let's move on. So that's the bottom of the pyramid. Very superficial. Okay. But some, especially guys, they're going to be like, pause, and they're going to go get that TV out. <laughs> but just understanding that, number one, relationship context. It's one of those things that kind of numbs your mind, zombie. You're not paying attention to the people you care about, that kind of thing. Now, let's get more into the scientific information here. Well, the television in your room, obviously, is going to be a very attractive lure and you're going to have a tendency to watch it, you know, especially when you're laying in bed and it's just like I'm relaxing, whatever. And it seems like a mundane activity. But Tony, what's been found and this is again, this is clinically proven is that when you're watching the television, parts of your brain are lighting up like the 4th of July, like it's it's going off like crazy. Mm-hmm. And in particular, the spectrum of light that's coming from your television, these blue light spectrums that are very similar to the spectrum coming from the sun. It's triggering your body to produce more cortisol, more daytime hormones. You're telling your body basically that it's daytime. And what happens with that, again, melatonin is going down. Mm -hmm. So even though you pass out and you go to sleep, you probably dream about Bobby Brown and that whole thing we talked (laughs) about. But you're not actually getting that deep rejuvenative sleep because of the cortisol secretion, because of the stress hormones you're producing by watching television. Mm -hmm. All right. So. That's one of the of the particular reasons. Another one is the fact that these electronic devices in and of themselves emit electromagnetic frequency, electromagnetic radiation. Just today, my I, I love my iPhone. I'm not like, you know, like, no, don't, you know, I'm not that guy. But I put a study out today just showing because I research this stuff every day and just find interesting things for my tribe, you know, for my people to listen to and to, to read that um, cell phone radiation. In particular, and this is goes for across the board, but in particular, this study was for men, showed that people who carry cell phones in their pocket had 8% greater incidence of having poor sperm motility, and basically they're destroying their sperm count, okay. right? These devices inherently kick off electromagnetic fields, even if they're turned off, okay? Even if I'm not on the phone, it's still broadcasting a signal. You know, if your TV's plugged in, it's still kicking out some, like this electromagnetic heat signature. All right. And all that stuff, just even in your room, you got your your phone in there, you've got your TV, you've got your whatever, your iPad, your lap. People is like a Best Buy location in their bed. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? It's just crazy that we can even do that today. But I want people to start to understand that our relationships, even though these electronic devices make us more connected, they're also separating us, Mm -hmm. you know, because we're more tuned into those things than the people around us who we really care about. So I'm just encouraging us to be a little bit smarter about how we use these amazing machines because I love my iPhone. I love my computer, you know, but I don't allow that stuff into my sacred space, you know, because in your bedroom, it should be primarily for two things, (laughs) you know, sleep and then, you know, get busy. So, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. So, so let's talk about like going to bed. I mean, guys, I mean, it, it, well, in general, does it matter what you wear to bed? Are you better off going to bed with no clothes on? Should guys wear tidy whities you know? Should they uh, sleep with a shirt on? Should they not sleep with a shirt on? What about women? Women's feet always get cold. Yeah. Some women sleep <laughs> Some women sleep in a bra because they're, they're, they're very busty. Right. And they say it's just more comfortable because, you know, they shift one way and their bosoms will go another way and stuff like that. So, yeah. I mean, lingerie, is that good? Is that bad? What, what about all this stuff of what you wear to bed? That's such a great question, man. This was probably the funnest chapter of my book, writing about, I, the title of this chapter is Dress for the Occasion. Because for me, I'm just like, what is it? it? It can't matter that much what you wear to bed. And so I looked into it. And man, it took me down like a seriously interesting and in some ways scary path, you know, when I started to find this stuff out. So our pajamas, just the whole idea of having our bed clothes, it's very relaxing. It's just like this kind of sentimental grounding thing when we get out of our like work day uniform and put on our home clothes and that's awesome but we need to be aware that the clothes that we wear to bed matter and they matter a lot and here's why one of the most interesting things that i found in the research was they um actually had uh patients in this particular study wear these thermosuits 
where they would lower their skin temperature. They lowered the ter- temperature of their skin just one degree without affecting their core temperature. So it wasn't like freezing their heart or anything like that. So just one degree temperature drop, and they've discovered that they slept more, they spent more time in a deep rejuvenative sl- stage of sleep, and they slept longer just by being one degree cooler, all right? So some people have a tendency, and you know, my wife's from Kenya, so you know, she, she likes it hot, right? So she's <laughs> gonna wear like layers and layers of clothes. Historically, that's what she used to do. And you know, got like, you know, a shirt on and like another shirt or, you know, these, you know, a whole bunch of other things like that. But what you're doing is, yeah, you can you can feel kind of comfy because you've you're you know, you're warm and you're going to sleep. But also they tend to sweat a lot at night because your body is much better at cooling you up. I mean, uh, warming you up than cooling you down. OK. And just that in of itself, understand that being cooler is going to get you into deeper stages of sleep. It's called thermal regulation. Our bodies do that naturally. When it's time to go to sleep, it will lower your body temperature to induce deep sleep. And we will prevent that by dressing up like a damn lumberjack and going to bed, right? <laughs> and nobody wants to sleep next to a lumberjack anyway. Right, right. So that was one of the shocking things. The other thing that I noted was the fact that women who wear bras to sleep, it was found that they actually have a 60% greater incidence of breast cancer. And now, wait, now, wait, now, wait, wait a minute. You, women who wear bras to sleep yes. have a 60% chance, a better chance of breast cancer. Yes, Mind blowing. And this Whoa. is not, yeah. And I went and I looked deeper and deeper and deeper into it. And you can look into the work of uh, Dr. Sid Singer and um, his book, Dress to Kill. All right. It's got a whole in depth understanding. And what I'm talking about, this is like Harvard study, Tony. Mm-hmm. This isn't like some, you know, uh, Larry down the street said, you know, <laughs> you should take them bras off. It's not like that. This yeah. is like real clinical, top of the, you know, upper echelon studies. And what it is, is like, and of course, that's for some people, especially women, they're going to be like, whoa, what? That's crazy. And what it is, Tony, is the fact that when, when, when women take their bras off and, and women and, and ladies who are listening to this, when you take your bra off and you see those lines over your shoulders and around mm-hmm. your back, around your breasts, that is literally indication that your lymphatic system is getting choked off and you're creating a blockage in your lymphatic flow. And that's very, very dangerous because your lymphatic system is your body's Basically, it's its cell, it's your cell waste management system. And if you're not allowing that to flow properly, you're going to get blocks in your system. It's kind of like getting a, a block in your plumbing at home. Like stuff can start breaking down, nastiness is going to surface. And one of those things that can start to happen is your, your DNA cell replication can get uh, inhibited and cancer can manifest. All right. And then once that happens, we continue to do the behavior. Instead of stopping the thing that's causing the problem, We'll all of a sudden it's doomsday. We got to get radiation, chemotherapy, and then we go back to doing the same behavior and wonder why again cancer returns. And that's a whole nother story, Tony. I'm very passionate about the subject of I uh, hear, yeah. cancer, yeah. but you know, just to understand why do, why would women do this and do that to themselves is this culture that we've created that, you know, you've got to make sure your breasts are, and bras make breasts look amazing. You know, mm-hmm. that's true. All right. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, and I cited this in the book is that there was a long term study done fine. And it finds that women who do not wear bras had greater uh, breast lift and they had greater, of course, um, lesser incidence of breast cancer, dramatically less, but um, less breast sagging. And in accordance with in um, relation to the nipple and the shoulder line, whatever they use as a, as a, a measuring stick. But they also found that they had more muscle tone around the best breast to support the breast. And there are muscles around, the breast is mostly fat, but there's muscles around the breast that actually, they get tonified if you're allowing gravity to work, you know, but if they're weightless in a bra all the time, that's cool, especially when you're younger, but when you get older, you're going to tend to have problems. And the whole issue with back pain, all that, again, that's programmed, Mm -hmm. you know, again, my wife's from Kenya, it's a whole different culture going on in many places of Africa. They don't even know what back problems are oftentimes, you know? (laughs) And, you know, so and of course, we also tend to see like, well, I don't want breast assist like those ladies on that, you know, Discovery Channel show. Right. 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 Again, we've got a whole different thing going on there with even how they uh, feed their children. Like sometimes they'll feed their they'll be standing up and Mm -hmm. be doing stuff. And the kid is just pulling their breast down. You Mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? It's like a whole different thing. The studies show and the statistics show that women who wear breasts um, wear bras less less often have much healthier and long-term staying power of their breasts and less sagging. So 
that's a whole thing, yeah, Tony, we're getting into, you I know. See. So how about fellas? <laughs> fellas, should we, what, what should we wear? I mean, the tidy yeah. whities uh, is that not a good idea? When you go to sleep, not so much. This yeah. is just a good opportunity to, because when you're wearing the tighter underwear and it's keeping your, your, your testicles closer to your body, you're going to have a greater propensity to overheat your tes- your testicles and you're going to damage your your production of sperm you know mm-hmm. it's just it is what it is because again our bodies are much better equipped at keeping us warm than keeping us cool this is why the 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 testicles can actually retract and get closer to you when you're cold right but what we want to do is especially at night this is an opportunity to you know throw some shorts on or go naked and just let your body do its natural thing and this is across the board for men and women this is just a good opportunity to do that and I put some specific recommendations about what to wear to bed. So for, for, for guys, it would be, you know, some basketball shorts and boxers, maybe a T-shirt, you know, just pretty simple stuff like that or go naked. For women, um, they can wear boy shorts. They're greater, you know, the significant others, boxers or T-shirts. Um, they can wear the tights that aren't actually choking out, doing like an MMA hold on their butt. Right. You know, I'm not talking about those, but tights that are that don't leave lines after you take them off. You know, okay. you can wear those, um, flowing lingerie. Def- you don't got to go like mama's family and put a, a muumu on, right? You don't <laughs> got to do that. No one will see that. But the, you know, some flowing lingerie or go naked. And then you okay. also get the benefit when you're naked of having more oxytocin produced if you sleep with someone, which is just going to make you sleep better. And I talk about that as well. Okay. Man, there's a lot of information in the book, 21 Tips, Sleep Smarter, 21 Tips to Sleep Your Way to a Better Body, Better Health, and Bigger Success. And, uh, you know, I, what is what is sleep apnea? I, I've heard that yeah. term, uh, and some people say it's it, it can be dangerous. What exactly is that for the, those of us who do not know? Wow. Uh, and it's, it's radical. It's just skyrocketing right now, Tony. Uh, to make it real simple, sleep apnea is a condition where there are pauses in breathing while an individual is asleep. So this can last for several seconds to several minutes. Okay, and basically the breathing path pathway gets constricted, and nine times out of ten is due to having excess weight on your frame, and it's basically collapsing your breathing pathway. Um, so the usual modality, and I've helped people to reverse this and to be free of the whole sleep apnea thing, but the the typical modality is like strapping somebody to like a CPAP machine, right? Mm-hmm. It's this assisted breathing machine where you've got like this mask on and you look like, you know, um, Sub-Zero from Mortal Kombat or something, you know, <laughs> and you're scaring your <laughs> you're scared of scorpion, kids. right? Get over yeah. here. <laughs> you know, when you're trying to go to bed at night and, you, you know, you've got that thing on and come here and you're trying to talk <laughs> to your lover. It's like it's not sexy. So we want to try to avoid that. Even if an individual is in a situation where they do have this machine, please understand that this can be re- reversed and you can get better. And what it really boils down to, Tony, is that we got to get the weight off their frame. But there's like a double-edged sword because the research shows that individuals who are heavier, they tend to have greatly degraded sleep quality. And when your sleep quality is degraded, it's going to make you heavier. Mm-hmm. So it's like this vicious circle that we've got to work to get out of. And this is why I created this book. And actually the long, the, the biggest chapter in the book, because I made them really quick and fun chapters, but the biggest one is how do I get the weight off and keep it off, you mm-hmm. know? And that, that chapter, I really went in on how do we actually do this? Because I'm a clinical nutritionist. This is where my focus has been this whole time. And I'm very, very good at it. And I love what I do. And I want people to have that information too. But the book is about sleep, you know? Mm-hmm. So, but I had to put that in there because it's, it's really a lot more simple than people are led to believe it is because it's a multi-billion dollar, you know, weight loss industry. You know, that's a lot right. of people's money that we're yeah. going to be dipping into if we actually get this stuff right and do it ourselves. So, can as we wrap up here, can specific dreams be an indication of a health problem? Mm. Tony, I looked into the whole dream world a little bit, but not too much. I wanted to keep it as scientific as possible. And when we get into the concept of dream, it's, it's a lot of concepts. It's a lot of guessing. It's a lot of hypothesis. Nobody really knows. Nobody really knows what's going on. And even in some ways how it's happening, there are certain parts of the brain that are lighting up. But I can tell you this for certain. Your dreams and people think that, oh, I'm, I got a vision. I got a dream. You know, there's some dream. It must. I dreamed about some fish. I must need to, you know, pregnant. Uh, Somebody's pregnant. Take, a, yeah. take yeah. a golf or something, you know. <laughs> 
But what it really is, it's your subconscious communicating to you. It is you. It's, it's you who's creating the dream. Because we, we tend to think that the dream is very external to us and it's kind of like we're living in it. Mm -hmm. It is you. It's your body and your mind that's listening to me right now. You're creating those dreams. Okay. And this is a lot of subconscious data that can be coming up because we all tend, we know in our heart what we really want. We know in our heart what our potential is. And sometimes that will speak to us when we're quiet, you know, when we've shut everything else down. So that's one little nugget for everybody. But yeah, the dreams, that's a whole, you know. Um, Just another book, huh? Yeah, absolutely, man. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Well, the book is uh, Sleep Smarter, 21 Proven Tips to Sleep Your Way to a Better Body, Better Health, and Bigger Success. You can get it from uh, Amazon. You can get it Kindle version. You can get the, the book itself. Some people are just old school. They like holding books. The Kindle lets you take it everywhere. You don't have to worry about uh, you know the weight of a book. Not that the book's heavy, but you know the whole yeah. thing. So, but it's available there. You can also go to the SeanStevensonModel dot com uh, to get information and his podcasts, which are very interesting. Uh, uh, about lots of different things regarding you, your body, your mind, your soul, your health, and that whole thing like that. He, he does a great job with that. Uh, I can vouch for him in that regard because he helped me out. But I'm, I'm glad that I was able to talk to him about this book. He always told me he was going to write a book about sleep. And I was thinking, well, well how, how, much is it, how, much, how, much, <laughs> how much information can you put about it? But he, apparently yeah. he, found, he found another, put a book together, and it's getting great reviews. So check it out. All right, Sean, thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. Thank you, Tony. It's my All pleasure, right. man. I'm Tony Scott. Thanks for watching Talking 360, and we'll see you next time.